Perfect. So my name is Shannon Keen. It doesn't look like it's pronounced Keen, but it is pronounced Keen. And I am a cloud advocate over at Microsoft. You might recognize some of the Nebraskan memorabilia behind me. I'm actually from Lincoln, Nebraska originally. I moved to the Chicago area back in 2004. So at my role at Microsoft, I work with a lot of the community. I try and bring about awareness in terms of trying to figure out how to make sense of the cloud and cloud adoption. Uh, the specific team I work on is the Enterprise Platforms and Tools team. We have been focused very heavily on Azure VMware solution. We think of this as Microsoft finally meeting the system administrators where they are. We've always done a good job of doing that with developers. Now we're finally doing that for system engineers as well. If you are active on Twitter, that's my handle. If you're active on LinkedIn, that's my link. Um, I can share this info with you as well. Um, that way you can connect with me. I don't just post about ABS type stuff. I'll post about everything I find interesting. Spend a lot of time in storage, a lot of time surrounding monitoring, the CAF, the, the WAF, the well-architected framework, as well as things like landing zones. So let's talk a little bit about the introduction and kind of background for the service. So when you look at cloud migration considerations, we tend to see them bucketed into kind of three main drivers. There's a need for speed, there's cost and complexity you have to factor in, as well as people and processes. That's everything from, I wanna get out of a data center contract. I am up for a hardware refresh. I don't wanna spend money on that. I want to think about getting us on to, getting whatever company you know we're talking to onto newer software, as well as, Will this solution adhere to our compliance standards? What does the business continuity and DR scenario look like? Um, thinking about things like skilling, right? That's always a, a harder to broach conversation with customers because a lot of these engineers are kind of sitting in the trenches, so to speak. They're very busy fighting IT fires. I wish we didn't have to fight them, but we're always fighting hardware and software, right? So the idea here is to think about that skilling component as well as some of the processes and procedures. You know, so all of this kind of factors into the, the true cloud migration considerations and why this service became an interesting thing for, for Microsoft to invest in. The migration strategies really move from left to right. There's rehost, refactor, rearchitect, and rebuild. I think if anybody's going through this right now or is starting to think about this or is in the middle of this, you know it's not a straightforward path to get from left to right. If it was, we'd all have magic wands and we'd already be over in the rebuilding side where we're very much so living in the cloud native land. We've kind of broken up the monolithic applications and we've been able to be more cloud native. Um, really that first past is the rehost, right? That's that lift and shift methodology. And prior to ABS really being a thing, you would have to land your entire workload onto an Azure IaaS VM. That became problematic because there was this whole concept of skilling, right? Um, all of a sudden your engineers had to go and take on Azure. That's not exactly an easy feat, especially when the cloud changes every, I don't know, I think it's like six to eight weeks. There's always something new you have to factor in. So now there is an Azure dedicated side of the house that focuses on purpose-built infrastructure. That's where Azure VMware Solutions lives. You think about the migration of an, your app estate, there's the risk of business disruption, there's that cloud scaling gap, and then there's the refactoring complexity. I used to work much more closely with customers, and we would spend a lot of time in these specific areas talking and trying to reduce the concern so that you could start thinking about moving forward with your digital transformation. What is Azure VMware Solution, right? It's a comprehensive VMware environment that lives on dedicated infrastructure. And when I say dedicated, this environment is dedicated to you. Those servers are part of your environment. It's not logically separated by any sort of software boundary. It's built by Microsoft and it's cloud certified by VMware, which is a weird reality because I think if anybody's been in IT as long as I've been in IT, and I think the number of us have been in IT long enough, you remember that it almost felt like they weren't friends. Now we're partners and we are really liking the synergy between both companies because what we're doing is we're enabling these enterprises to come and make use of the cloud at a pace that makes more sense for them. So you run your VMware workloads natively on Azure. It's supported and operated by Microsoft, which is a cool reality because you don't have to think about um, that division of support, right? It's a Microsoft owned product and Microsoft then leans on VMware for any support related issues. 
This really allows you to manage and secure your applications across VMware environments in Microsoft Azure with a consistent operating framework. I think that's the key part here. You don't have to go and reinvent the wheel and embrace IaaS and figure out, can I put a load balancer in front? Can I think about an application gateway? You know, those types of things. Now you can think about skilling at a pace that's right for your company because you're taking that platform on-prem that you've invested a number of years at this point, right? And man, man hours and, and women hours on trying to make sure that this in, these environments are up and functional. You can think about, plugging all of that into Azure and taking your enterprise's platform and moving it there. So this isn't our first go round related to the purpose built infrastructure for Azure. You may have been paying attention to developments over the last handful of years. We've got an SAP offering that lives on dedicated infrastructure, Nutanix, NetApp, SkyTap, Cray, and then VMware is just another one that adds into the mix here. But if you think about it, once you get those bigger type workloads into Azure, maybe your more complex workloads, you've got seamless integration with other Azure services. So you can think about backup, you can think about dev tests, security, DevOps, you can think about monitoring and any of the AI stuff you want to get into, right? You don't have to go to IaaS first in order to embrace some of the Azure services that Microsoft is just known for. And then we've got the native IaaS and PaaS offerings as well, which is something you can take on and really transform your business at a time that makes the most sense. Right now, the service is deployable in these regions. So this version of AVS, we had a version that came out prior to. If anybody followed the solution over the course of the last couple of years here, the first iteration was Cloud Simple. This iteration is just called Azure VMware Solution. You can deploy it in West US, East US, North Central, Canada Central, North Europe, UK South, West Europe, Southeast Asia, Japan East, and Australia East. If anybody paid attention to the Cloud Simple version of ABS, there were a number of uh, regions that were it was able to be deployed in. The weird part about it, though, is it wasn't as vast as this go round, and there are more regions kind of in the hopper, so to speak. More regions will be lit up over the course of the next handful of months here. So just stay tuned and you'll see these announcements come out on the Azure blog or some sort of service announcement. So that's that tends to be where we focus all of the that information. So you're able to migrate and extend your VMware workloads into the cloud. So there's that built in con uh, continuity the speed and scale with modern infrastructure. These are all hyper-converged nodes and they're dedicated to you. You can use the existing VMware skills and tools that you've invested in over the years. You can then seamlessly modernize apps over time with Azure. You don't have to embrace IaaS out the, the gate, so to speak. Then we've got some really cool pricing incentives for Windows Server and SQL Server. This tends to accelerate the journey to cloud. This really speeds up the transformation process because I can tell you working with a number of customers over the years, even that lift and shift strategy would take forever to get past certain hurdles, whether it be security buy-in, management buy-in, or just unraveling technical debt. Now I have to be very conscious about saying technical debt. My boss says it's technical as excellence because it's never debt unless you know it's bad for you, right? So I think every enterprise has that story. There's a lot of documentation that probably hasn't been done or you don't know what lives in your environment because you have allowed business units to go and spin up um, applications. So this type of platform helps you start to figure out what you have, what can actually be refactored, what then can be re-architected and re-platformed as part of this migration strategy moving from left to right. And I, I'm going off of memory. I don't know if I got every one of those right, but the idea is going from lift and shift to more of a cloud native approach. So when you get started with Azure VMware solution, the, the major components here are data center expansion, reduction or retirement. So you get the idea of talking to, to customers that are looking to get out of the data center business. Um, they don't want to have to spend a ridiculous amount of money to buy new hosts. This is a great opportunity for them to move the burden of responsibility over to Microsoft, and then they don't have to be on the hook the same way that they would be if it was in an environment that they managed. Um, there's a speed and simplification component here. Uh, if anybody's worked on a vSphere upgrade, you know it can take sometimes many, many months to go through. It's not a straightforward process. Deploying this literally takes about two and a half to three hours. 
So think about that, right? I think when I deployed it the first time, my mind kind of blew up thinking about how much more simplified this whole approach is versus waiting for the hardware to come in, you know, getting the time to rack and stack, getting the cabling figured out, getting all of the VLANs configured, et cetera, right? That, that takes time and coordination. Now you can just go into the portal and deploy it. It really kind of makes me think, I wish we had this about five to 10 years ago. It would have made things so much easier. You can also think about DR and business continuity as part of this as well. So there's a way in which to think about leaning on ABS as a DR environment. Uh, maybe it's just an environment you're starting to kind of play around with. You do get the first 30 days for free. And then you can think about, uh, you know, modernizing your estate over the course of time. So you can build out dev test environments. You can build out multiple staged type environments as well. Um, Microsoft and VMware have come together and, and come up with ways to partner up with you. So the cool part about this is if you are interested, you've got ways in which to think about uh, leaning on your Microsoft account team who will then pull in VMware specialists to make sure that this, this whole engagement is a successful realization of placing your VMware workloads in Azure. There's a great way to do assessments as well, right? I think a lot of us know that, you know, you give an environment to business units, they'll go spin up whatever they want to. You may not know what that in, that business unit group actually has. So running through an assessment with Microsoft and VMware will help in terms of the process. Then you can create and deploy the ABS software defined data center, uh, like I said, in a few hours, which is great. It's pretty straightforward. You'll connect AVS and VMware to on-prem. So the service deploys with an express route and the recommended pattern is to have your own express route. And then you'll enable global reach between both of those environments. And then that's what handles the BGP routing into and out of AVS and then through Azure back to on-prem. Um, so this helps quite a bit here in terms of setting up the stage for a full-blown migration. When you think about environments living in Azure outright, you get that self-service elasticity and scale. We've got a number of industry certifications and this environment is constantly going through rigorous security attestations. So that's another thing to pay attention to, as well as you know high availability, DR, backup, resiliency, and then low, lat low latency express route. We've also got the VMware components as well, right? That doesn't go away. We've got vSphere, vSAN, NSXT, HCX, all of the things that you should be familiar with, and it probably will lessen the anxiety when I start talking about these things, because I think a lot of us went through managing and maintaining entire infrastructures where this was a big part of our world, knowing how to manage vSphere, knowing how to automate certain components inside of vSphere, knowing how to do vMotion, right? And vMotion is done using HCX. So it's, it's still the same tools that you've been familiar with. Um, it's just now in Azure versus on-prem. And when you think about modernizing, having API management, hybrid hub and spoke, you can think about using Azure Security Center, Azure Monitor, storage optimization. I mean, really, once you get into Azure, the ceiling, or not, there's no, actually, there's no ceiling, I should say, the sky is the limit, not the ceiling, the sky is the limit. So you've got a great way of thinking about the fact that you could just onboard about any Azure service, so long as it made sense in terms of what you were trying to achieve. Um, in fact, I often joke that it's kind of like achievement unlock, getting your environment into Azure. So the new and differentiated features this time around, it's a first party Azure service. It's cloud certified by VMware. There's a seamless Azure experience as well. So the cloud simple version of this had two portals. You just go into the Azure Resource Manager portal this time around. So it makes things easier and more simplified. You can use the Azure hybrid use benefit for Windows and SQL Server, which is a big plus if you're running a bunch of Windows workloads. And then you've got the free extended security updates for Windows and SQL Server of the 2008-2008 R2 flavor. So that's kind of a cool reality. Single point of support, you're just calling Microsoft. Microsoft will then engage VMware in the event there's something that needs to be troubleshot with VMware, right? It's something in the vSphere layer, not the Azure layer. Microsoft will take care of that for you. You don't have to open up a separate ticket with VMware. So that actually makes things a lot more simplified in terms of trying to think about your burden of responsibility, right? Uh, Microsoft's helping you out on that front. Uh, the, there's the latest VMware technology updates, and I say this with one little slight caveat. Um, engineering is taking care of N minus one version. So the current version is vSphere 7.0. What's deployed inside of AVS is 6.7 update three. And if there's a bunch of VMware gurus, you know that that's not necessarily super old. It's getting to the point where EOL is being discussed and I think it's been extended due to COVID. But the reality is we're certifying a lot of things simultaneously while we're trying to provide environments. So engineering will always maintain N minus one. So always be within one version of the current release and then security patches and 
updates will be taken care of by Microsoft as well. So think about the fact that you might be able to enjoy your weekend. Uh, Microsoft will take care of that for you. We've got HCX Enterprise Edition. So if you need more than three site pairings, you can add this on right now. It's in public preview. The pricing hasn't been determined. Once it reaches GA, you'll get a billing notification and that'll tell you if you want to opt in or opt out. Um, you get the high performance dedicated hosts so that those are your own hosts. And then you've got the, the unified licensing and consumption model, right? So it's all in the same spot as everything else. You don't have to go too far to figure out what your costs are going to be. And it's an hourly pay as you go. Then there's a simplified NSX interface as well, right? So the idea of NSX was never like a everybody in, you know deployed it within their environment. It was always kind of a mixed bag on who would actually embrace NSXT. So because of that fact, we offer a simplified interface, which is actually really helping uh, those admins that never really embraced NSXT on prem, but were still very heavy in the vSphere land. This is the software and hardware package that's deployable right now. So it's 6.7 up, update 3 Enterprise Plus, the vCenter 6.7 update 3 standard, the, that's the vSAN NSXT version, HCX version, right? So the HCX Enterprise is available. It's that monthly, pri uh, monthly pricing and like a public preview. Again, the pricing hasn't been fully fleshed out, so to speak. Um, that will happen in short order when it reaches GA. So you'll get some sort of billing notification. And if you decide you don't want it, it's a matter of opting out. So it's something to experiment with if you are interested. The hardware specifications are over on the right. We never go into the vendor. It really shouldn't matter, but you actually can see what's deployed inside of an AVS environment. So I'm not going to try and tell you that you can't see it. It's literally vCenter running in Azure. Um, but the idea is at any point in time, we may choose to switch vendors. The big thing is if we do switch vendors, this, it'll have the same specs, right? And the math is kind of called at the bottom of the slide. You need a minimum of three nodes per vSphere cluster. There's a maximum of 16 nodes for vSphere cluster. And there's a maximum of 96 nodes to an Azure private cloud instance. We recently expanded the 96 nodes. So we're really uh, moving towards this idea of being enterprise grade ready. And we're trying to be that one stop shop for even the largest of environments. The features are pretty similar to what I've talked about, right? The idea that it's the familiar VMware technology, so the native vSphere support, the fully integrated native, uh, networking stack, the vSphere management, vSAN and NSXT, the HCX components, right? And then you've got the Azure integrations, so you can think about management and governance, you can think about Azure Arc enabling your servers and being able to, to do audits against what's been deployed to make sure that certain things are adhered to from a best practice perspective based upon your company. Um, you can think about adding on security, right? Sometimes bringing your own security solution into Azure is a very pricey reality. Azure Security Center is a great thing to bolt onto your AVS environment. You can think about the free version. You could also extend it and think about enabling Azure Defender. It'll help you out a little bit related to some of those compliance regulations if that's where you sit. And if a lot of folks are Blue Cross Blue Shield, I'm sure that that's kind of in your, right up in your world, right? Um, the, the low latency connectivity into Azure is another big component here in terms of integration. You get to, you, really, it's one of those things, once you get into Azure, you can just you can do just about anything. Um, and then talking about the single point of support, the DevOps tool chain, you can really start thinking about bringing through a CICD tooling mechanism, whether it be Azure DevOps or Jenkins or something of that sort. You don't have to think about being 100% Azure native to make use of those tools. Um, the high performance cloud infra, right? So it's it's optimized elastic infrastructure. You've got the idea of self-service provisioning. There are dedicated isolated bare metal infrastructure that's yours. Nobody else is trying to deploy against it. So it's 100% your environment. And then you've got redundancy and placement control as to where your VMs live. You can move things around if you need to. And then there's the security and encryption, both within inside Azure, as well as inherited VMware security. Um, you can think about reserved instances. So the one or three year can be applied to an AVS environment. You see that there's some significant cost savings. If this is going to be something that will live in your world for a while, I always recommend the reserved instances. Um, just because of the fact that you may not know what the end state is going to be and we're not planning on decomming the service um, unless we have maybe just one customer in, right? We don't think that's going to be the, the reality. We're, we're making an, an awesome investment across these two companies that never existed prior to, well, never existed the same way that it does today. I think that's probably a better way of saying it. And then you can think about the 
extra discounts on top, right? Um, the hybrid use benefit, that's another way to think through some of the better pricing scenarios, as well as the free extended security updates. So let's talk a little bit about what a deployment looks like. So like with most Azure resources, you fill out a couple of fields, right? You fill out, you, you tie it to a subscription, you tie it to a resource group, you tie it to a location, one of the locations I talked about earlier in the presentation. You'll provide a resource name. I don't think it can be longer than 14 characters because you run the risk of not being able to use a public IP. And then you'll want to pick the SKU. Now, right now, there's only one SKU. It's the AB36 SKU. That's not to say that there will never be another SKU, but that's a thing you have to factor in, right? As time moves forward, there'll be that'll be some interesting development work done by our engineering teams. Then you'll place a, a address block in. So the AVS environment ingests a slash 22 CIDR network that's only used by AVS. That's the only time you see that environment. And then you can tie it to a virtual network or you can create the virtual or you can tie it to a virtual network after you create it. So it's really up to you. If you tie it to a virtual network as you're building it, all of the peering from the AVS Express route into Azure is done automatically for you. If you don't, then you have to do the peering after the fact, right? So um, this actual kind of walkthrough presupposes you are going to be build, building the VNet after the fact, and then you'll want to create some sort of bastion, some sort of locked down jump host because you can't access the web GUI otherwise. So, and it's something I recommend just keeping because you never know what that connectivity is going to look like between your on-prem and Azure. Um, you'll have to create the auth keys for Express Route, and you'll create the Express Route VNet gateway, um, and then you'll connect that VNet gateway into Azure, and that's what enables you to be able to use all of those Azure services. Then you'll connect to the jump host behind the bastion. You'll connect to the vCenter. You'll connect to NSXT, and then you'll have to enable global reach for on-prem access, and that's really what enables the BGP routing from on-prem into AVS because it has to travel through to Azure and then travel from Azure into AVS. And because it's a bare metal offering, our engineering teams haven't figured out the right way to have it land on a VNet. Um, I suspect at some point it'll mature and get to where it needs to be, but right now that's the only extra headache you have to factor in, right? And I say it lightly because I don't think it's necessarily a deal breaker of a headache. We usually have a lot of networking folks that'll come in and help you realize the value of this and turn on BGP because it's not a trivial task. This is the architecture of what it looks like. Uh, you can see that, you know, you would essentially initiate the connection into the Azure portal. You would connect into the Azure Bastion subnet, which then you would connect into your jump box via a private IP, which would then give you access into vCenter. I can show you, if I get around to it, I can show you what we've done with my demo environment, um, and I'll explain why it's a little bit more uh, on the crazier side. It was one of those things where uh, we were given an environment in one region, and I can't deploy certain resources in that region, so I had to do some interesting things to make it work related to, to VNet peering uh, across regions. So let's talk a little bit about the network architecture. So this is the basic interconnectivity model. This is what is enabled when you build your AVS environment without having to turn on global reach. You get basic interconnectivity. And that's the connectivity from the express route circuit that gets deployed with AVS into Azure. Um, and that's, the, it's, if you've ever done express route peering, it, it should feel pretty normal. It shouldn't feel very foreign. Um, and if you, haven't ever done it before. There's a lot of good scaling content that I'll turn you over to at the tail end of this. So, uh, but yeah, this is really designed for kind of POCing the service. Um, maybe you don't necessarily need on-prem access, or maybe you're waiting for your express route circuit. Sometimes folks decide not to do anything. They just wait until the express route comes before they even try and deal with express route uh, and global reach. But this is one of the, the two connectivity models. This is the full interconnectivity model where you're taking your AVS environment with the express route, you're peering it into Azure, and then you're taking your express route from on-prem and you're peering it privately into Azure. And then you enable global reach and you've got BGP routing between on-prem, Azure, and your AVS envi environment bi-directional. So it's kind of a cool reality. Again, it's a little awkward at times, um, unless you're super savvy on the networking front. Um, I'd always recommend working with our global black belts. That's what they're called. So expressing interest, getting connected with your Microsoft account teams. They can work on finding the right resources to come in and help you 
plot this out as as successfully as possible because the idea here is we, we'd love you to be as successful as possible in the platform as well uh, we don't want to just say here spin it up and you have nobody to go to when something doesn't want to work right so we've got a lot of networking gbbs that work in close conjunction with the abs gbbs we also offer up a site-to-site -site ipsec vpn tunnel that star there is basically to stress this is not considered a VMware backed SLA migration pattern. That's the one big thing here, but it's supported for uh, pre express route testing. So if you want to try a migration pattern while you're waiting for express route, you could spin up a site to site VPN and migrate a VPN over that link. Um, or if you just needed hybrid connectivity, you maybe you don't plan on doing a lot of migration, you're going to back up and redeploy or, or something, right? There's a lot of different scenarios that I could think of. This would be a, a supported scenario if you just needed hybrid connectivity and couldn't get buy-in to get express route. So let's talk a little bit about the migration side of things. So you'll want to assess your environment that'll help you identify the workloads to migrate. That'll also help you figure out the migration pattern. So HCX provides live, bulk, and cold migration patterns. So live is just, there's no downtime, the VM never powers off, it moves seamlessly from one environment to the other. Cold is a VM that's powered off, maybe it's a dev or a test workload that only gets spun up a couple times a week or a couple times a month. You can migrate using HCX with the cold migration. Bulk migration is for the larger scale migration patterns, or if you're running an older vSphere environment, um, I think it's 5.0, up to 6.0, you have to downgrade your HCX connector, and then that allows you to be able to, to migrate, uh, but you have to do the bulk migration. So you'd have to factor in a true change window, and but HCX speeds that up, right? It'll help you out related to the parallel VM threads. So it won't feel like it's a super single threaded process. It should get up there fairly quickly. This will then help you figure out the steps to full production. So you'll build that proof of concept with Microsoft, right? And you'll be super successful because you'll have Microsoft and VMware. Uh, you'll probably know them by, by first names. You'll probably know, you know things about their life, right? These, these, these folks are trying to come in and help you be as successful as possible. So you create the private cloud, you move a few VMs using your preferred migration type, which actually gets you to that point where you're building the at scale migration adoption pattern. And you can lean on Microsoft Fast Track or support from certified partners if it's one of those things where you just don't have the time to do the migration. Sometimes folks might get out of the world of, you know, constantly being the sole provider of sustainability within the environment. So maybe it's an opportunity for you to uh, take on a partner. Maybe there's a way you could think about even having Microsoft help you a bit um, related to some of the some of the cost analysis, right? So that should get you where you need to be so you can be as successful as possible. Azure Migrate now can as of uh, let's see we ran ignite back in march so that's when this reached ga it was in public preview back when the service ga in september of last year you can now run an azure migrate assessment for avs which is awesome so you're using that same hub that you would use for databases uh, what else can it do web servers i think you could do vdi environments etc i mean it does a lot and i feel like it continues to add more and more every time i go into azure migrate i'm always shocked all the different services you can now run a, an, an assessment against your vmware environment it'll, it'll kind of tell you if your environment's ready it'll tell you what needs to be factored in in order to be able to migrate it it'll help you with cost planning uh, help you with right sizing your environment because as you know vmware will always borrow and maybe it only really uses two gigs out of the four gigs you've provisioned from a memory standpoint right so those types of assessments are, are critical because it might help you right size the vm once it lands inside of uh vsphere inside of azure now it will share once it gets into azure so i don't want to set the stage in saying that vmware is not going to continue to do what's normally been doing it's just sometimes you might realize okay hey that web server really doesn't get hit the way we thought it was going to get hit so it's an opportunity to assess and maybe right size before you migrate um, the assessment feature uh, can actually support up to 35,000 vmware servers in one azure migrate project I have yet to personally work with a customer or talk to a customer that has more than 35,000 VMs. And I'm sure there is a customer out there that it kind of exists, right? But um, I have yet to, to meet that customer. So that's a pretty sizable amount of servers it can assess inside of one project. The HCX 
components will help you migrate to Azure. That helps you with the live migration without the cost complexity or risk of refactoring. That really helps with the minimal downtime. Um, you know, you'll extend the proven tools, skills, and policies within your VMware environment, your VMware ecosystem, and that eliminates the need and cost of reskilling. So I like this a lot because of the fact that it really helps you take that vMotion technology, which I just fell in love with once I started realizing what it could do, and it extends it into a, a cloud. And it's not just Azure, right? It's any cloud, um, as well as you can think about HCX in between two different vSphere sites. So. You can do the large scale bulk migration using HCX. You've got the replication assisted vMotion. So that's uh, where you use the HCX interconnect appliance along with replication and vMotion technologies to provide the large scale parallel migration threads with zero downtime. That's what I was talking about earlier. HCX is kind of like vMotion on steroids. Um, that's probably the best way I can think of to describe it. It's taking vMotion that we've all fell in love with. I mean, it really saved a lot of folks over the course of time, and it's speeding up the process of migrating as quickly as possible using vMotion as your kind of tried and true tested methodology. Um, it, it will do the any vSphere to vSphere migration, so you don't have to think about it only going into Azure. It's a very multi-pronged tool, and it's something to explore if you haven't yet. Every environment's different, so I don't think everybody has embraced HCX the same way that I probably would have if I was internal. So I wanted to bring that up, um, as well as you know, you can think about HCX for site pairing and uh, DR. The parallel VM migration threads speed up the process. You can also think about um, no changes in IPs. There's a way in which to use HCX to extend layer two into Azure. Of course, if you're doing that, I would I would want to ask why, but no, it's a possibility, right? And that's where working with Microsoft would be really impactful so that you don't trip up because our global black belts have seen about every different iteration of a vSphere environment on-prem. They'll be able to walk you through this and make sure that you don't stumble or have a situation where it's not super pleasant. You know, some, some systems down and your users are complaining. It also provides a secure proxy for vMotion and replication traffic as well. How am I doing on time? Not terrible. All right, let's go through the management and operations next. So I think a lot of us have seen this slide with Azure being in the center. Now we've got it with Azure VMware Solution in the center. Not that I'm trying to detract 100% from Azure because I think Azure is an amazing cloud. There's a lot of cool nifty things. I wouldn't be working at Microsoft if I thought it was a terrible cloud. So, but if you think about it, once you get your platform into Azure, you can then make use of all of these different areas that you may not have thought through before, right? You can think about configuration management techniques. You can think about bringing about maybe more automation, um, using some of the cloud native services that are pretty inexpensive, right? So backup, all of the security components within Azure Security Center, Sentinel, you can think about some of the identity protection components of Azure Active Directory. And then you've got policy management, right? So Azure policy can be applied to the environment if they're Azure Arc enabled servers. You can think about cost management. Maybe it was hard to try and track costs because a lot of companies operated at a CapEx model. It was a sunk cost. So once you kind of get into the, the Azure platform, you get more features that you may not have even thought through. And so if you think about it, you know, Azure VMware solution gets you past that first hurdle of getting your VMs inside of Azure and get you more comfortable with embracing these services at the right time that makes sense for you. So it's the familiar and consistent VMware tools and technology. So you get to create that operational consistency for your admins. Um, when I've had these conversations, I almost can feel the anxiety levels lowering significantly because a lot of folks used to have this I don't want to move forward. I don't want to change my job. My job's going to be, you know, irrelevant in two years. And that's so not the case, right? Um, it's changing. That's all it's doing. It's just changing. So the idea here is to try and think about positioning this as a way where you don't have to take a traditional sysadmin through a full-blown transformation into Azure first, first go around. You could think about slowly getting that engineer where they need to be before you say, okay, now we're 100% in Azure, but there's nothing on-prem anymore, right? This kind of is like the extra set of training wheels when you're trying to become more comfortable with what Azure can actually do. You get access to vSphere, HCX, NSXT, that's all enabled during the private cloud deployment. The credentials are registered in Azure to connect to the hosts, which is kind of a cool reality. You can easily scale the infrastructure as your business needs it, right? So this screenshot here shows you how quickly it is to just edit the cluster. 
and this is actually my cluster. Uh, I had to update the screenshot for this slide, so and I didn't have a lot of. It takes, like I said, it takes about two and a half hours to deploy. I didn't have two and a half hours to redeploy it to make it match all of the other slides. But um, it just showcases how simple it is to go in and and edit your your the amount of hosts in your environment. Um, you so you can do this in an automated fashion. It doesn't have to be manual. You can spin up some sort of script. You could think about leaning on Azure Automation. You could trigger something to happen. You could have metric-based triggers occur. Um, and then the idea here is you could add and delete new clusters as required. You just can't go less than three. And then I call it the math once more to kind of hit home that it really is enterprise grade and ready for just about every environment I can I could think of. I always like to talk about the shared responsibility matrix. This is what gets a lot of folks realizing that giving Microsoft responsibility is not necessarily a bad thing. So host patching, ESXi host maintenance, power, any sort of equipment failure, that's all Microsoft, right? As well as maintaining the portal, the physical security to the actual data centers themselves, thinking through deployment, lifecycle management, et cetera, vSphere, that's all handled by Microsoft. You get to focus on the cooler things, which is configuration management of your guest OSs, the applications, the middleware, how to present business apps to your end users. I feel like that's something that's hard to do, and the synergy has never really quite been there because IT in the traditional world of on-prem infrastructure, you would have to run around and deal with every little thing that would go wrong in your environment. So dividing that burden of responsibility up between Microsoft and the customer helps to alleviate some of the, uh, the, the pain points of what the digital transformation would look like for a company. This is like kind of a, a quick picture of the deployment, right? So you know, you're accessing everything from the portal Right, and then it's another kind of way of looking at the diagram I had shown a couple slides back. Um, I don't know, I, I feel like a lot of visuals here are, are important because I think I've gone through conversations like this before and I've had people say, Nate, well, wait, how many express route circuits do I get? You get two. Uh, so I, that's why I have another one in here that's kind of the same, but the idea here is to really showcase that it's a, it's a deployment that's that while it's complex, the complexity, a lot of it's abstracted from you in terms of kind of regular day-to-day -day maintenance. You will manage your private cloud in a handful of areas on the Azure Resource Manager portal. Um, it's all highlighted here. Then your vCenter web client URL shows up there. The admin user shows up underneath. And then I don't know if you can see the uh, vCenter admin password. That's been abstracted. So prior to a recent change in engineering, you had to supply a password and that would expire every 90 days and customers weren't happy with opening up a ticket with support and changing their password. So this is all abstracted. And what you do when you have to access your vCenter environment or your NSXT environment is you copy that password with that little copy um, icon and that allows you to paste it in and you've got access to your environment. And uh, you can access the environment via the Azure CLI, PowerShell, Power CLI, the portal, the jump host. It's there's 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 a lot happening there. Um, let's see. So you you access with the cloud admin account. So it's different than like the administrator at vSphere.local account. It's it's the almost the same exact account, but it's something that Microsoft has provisioned versus the administrator at vSphere.local account. It's one extra protection layer to make sure that somebody's not trying to get into your environment. Uh, we'll use the HCX components for that hybrid lift and shift, or we'll, we'll want customers to lean on it. That's all done inside the HCX portal. So you've got your ability to set up a site pairing, the interconnect, the network extension, the migration components, as well as disaster recovery. So that's a kind of a neat thing. Uh, it's all built into the same kind of, well, I mean, it's literally a separate tab in your web portal, but it's one of those things where, you know, I think it's become much more easier to see some of this. Let's talk a little bit about the integrations as well. So right now we've got Azure NetApp files for file share, Azure Blob Storage, there's some integrations there. There definitely are integrations with Azure Traffic Manager and Application Gateway. There's support for Hub and Spoke. There's some Azure Backup Server components, right? So if you want to think about Microsoft Azure Backup Server, you can think about having that back up your AVS VMs without having to integrate with a third-party vendor that you've got. Um, then there's the Azure Monitor and Azure uh, Security Center and Azure Sentinel. So those are some of the 
integrations that exist at present that have been sort of documented and they're going to get uh, a lot more documented and a lot more kind of talked about over the course of the next uh, probably hand like six to eight months, I would say you're going to see a lot more integrations and you're going to see a lot more um, coverage on the ways in which you can think about plugging ABS into existing Azure services. So this is a quick visual, right? You've got your log analytics workspace. You've got your Azure VMware solution SDDC that's pointing to the log analytics workspace. It's also pointing to an Azure uh, automation account as well as Azure update management. You can think about using it for, for patching. Um, then you've got Azure Security Center. You can set up alerts. You can send those alerts to Azure Sentinel. Maybe you could bring your own ITSM solution in. I, I hope what I've at least shown is literally the sky is the, the limit, right? If there's a myriad of different ways you can think about deploying your environment without having to reinvent the wheel. Um, you could bring what you've got on-prem, you can embrace what exists natively. You, you're, you're, in theory, you're covered from a number of different angles. The workload backups, what I wanna talk about real quick here. So you can uh, backup you know, your ABS running workloads with Microsoft Azure backup servers. You would deploy it as an Azure IaaS VM, so you would have to embrace IaaS unless you choose not to, and then you could just back up however you want to, right? But the idea here is it's an opportunity for you to explore um, kind of our native backup solution uh, and just figure out if it's, if it's a good fit, right? A lot of customers deploy it in conjunction with something else that they already have inside of Azure, so it's a great tool to have, especially if something ever decides it doesn't want to back up correctly, right? Never hurts to have multiple ways to back things up. Um, and then the, the the documentation is uh, linked to in this slide here. So I think what I'll have to do is I'll have to probably send you a, uh, a, probably a PDF of this presentation and you can share it with the, the community. And this kind of highlights the architecture, right? The MAB servers talking to the Azure Recovery Services Vault. Then there's that virtual network gateway that's talking to the vCenter as it stands. And it's kind of all lumped together in an interesting boundary, making up your deployment inside of one region. But you're able to do backups there. And you do have to store, well, I always recommend like one or two days on local disk, and then the rest of it moves automatically to the recovery services vault. And that's where you start to see the value of what Azure can do, right? It's a pretty inexpensive way to make sure that your environment's backed up. These are also available today, right? Commvault, Veritas, Veeam. If you are one of those customers, there is a solution that already backs up ABS for you. There's more, um, we call these independent software vendors that are on the way. Um, so just stay tuned and connect, feel free to connect with me. Um, I'll do my best to find out those dates of when these new vendors are ready to go. Um, I cannot talk about them, but they are, there are more in the hopper. So if you are not a Commvault, uh, customer, a Veritas customer, or a Veeam customer, there are more coming. And you could even talk to your backup vendor if you are one of those third, heavy third-party backup users. I think as I've covered, right, the support here is all done by Microsoft. So Microsoft will be the first contact you'll make. Um, they'll troubleshoot all of the Azure components. They will figure out if it's something at the Azure layer and then they will engage with VMware in the event there's a problem that requires VMware's assistance, right? And Microsoft will continue to be your central point of resolution, so keep that in mind as well. Um, I want to talk a little bit about resources. Okay, we're doing pretty good on time. I thought I was going to be a little bit over. We're not. Thumbs up. Uh, so there are VMware hands-on labs for AVS. That's the short URL. It'll take you to the first two that are that have been published. The first one surrounds deployment, setting all of that up, connecting it into Azure, making sure that you you can get everything up and functional. And then the second one really deals with migration. And there's more coming on the VMware front. So this is one of the kind of skilling areas to go deeper on. The other one is uh, we've now been working on a learn path. So if you're familiar with Microsoft Learn, it's a free way to learn more about Azure services. And it's starting to even go more than Azure services. So then we've got Power Platform paths, PowerShell paths, um, Python. I think they've got like a Java path now. I mean, it's, it's insane how much this has scaled over the course of the last almost two years. So this is the very first one that we've published. It surrounds the um, deployment aspect of what it would take to get your environment deployed 
and how to think about connecting it to on-prem so that you have the ability to migrate VMs from on-prem into Azure. We are adding an additional two modules to this path. There's going to be kind of an intro. There'll be a deployment and a migration path. So those should hopefully go live. Oh, I wish I could just predict the future. Our, our goal is before the end of the fiscal year. And if you're a Microsoft person, you know that's the end of June. So um, in theory, we should have it done before then, but I, we wanna give ourselves some wiggle room in the event that uh, certain things don't tend to work out right when it comes to building things and schedules and you know certain outages. And, and, and we still have that at Microsoft, right? I wish we didn't, it would make things so much easier, right? But we, we wanna make sure we've got enough um, bandwidth and runway in front of us that we I don't overcommit and say, we'll have it done by the end of the month, because we won't. Um, um, but I think our goal is before the end of the fiscal year. So you, so you know, stay tuned. Um, feel free to connect with me. I will definitely amplify this. This one I actually wrote, so it was fun to learn, work with the Learn team on this one. And then these are the resources that I like to leave customers with, right? So the overview, the documentation as it stands. There's some Azure VMware solution videos. However, they are slightly dated, but the the functionality has been ported over to the version of AVS that GA'd last September. Um, the VMware ports and protocols, this is really helpful if you are a uh, working for an environment that has locked down networking. You'll wanna make sure all those ports are opened or at least factored in related to deployment of the service. Um, the HCX documentation is something I like to talk about as well because we don't maintain that, right? That's VMware's HCX documentation. So we always recommend going there because it doesn't make sense to duplicate that, right? In fact, our documentation references the HCX documentation. And then we've got the HCX release notes. We recently upgraded to HCX 4.0. There's some changes that came about, namely the whole notion of supportability for the older uh, vSphere environments. We can still get your VMs into AVS, there's just a little bit of configuration effort that you'll have to work on with Microsoft and a partner potentially to make sure that you're you, you, you've accounted for that right and then the the learn module and the hands on labs. And I do have a demo, but I was mostly just going to kind of walk through this so let me let me do this I will exit out of this. I've got I can do a quick seven minute demo little, little walk through here. So. This is the resource group I've deployed the environment that my team manages and maintains. This is the actual VMware environment, ABS, right? As I showcased in the slide deck, this is where you manage certain things like connectivity, identity, and clusters. So connectivity, this will show up where uh, you can enable a public IP. This is where you do all of, so I've got a public IP. I was experimenting with this today. So now I've got a way in which to present like web servers external to um, AVS, right? So sometimes folks still are running, you know, IAS websites that need to be externally facing. You would need to enable a public IP on the vCenter or the AVS environment. Um, it dawned on me, I've got my Azure mask on so I can show you what's been deployed. So this is the vSphere uh, IP address. This is the NSXT IP address. This is the HCX uh, IP address. Let me, let me move that for a second. I'm gonna grab the vMotion network. I need to think about this before I got on with everybody. So bear with me here. So these are what shows up. So this is the vMotion network and this is the private cloud network. So I gave it a 10.5.0.0 slash 22 and all of the automation built into this carved everything up for me. I didn't have to be a super wizard in terms of CIDR notation. Um, this is where you do your express route configuration, right? This was done automatically for me when I provisioned everything. Uh, I we don't have global reach enabled, but I had to create some screenshots for a global reach configuration. This is the HCX components. Like I'd mentioned, the HCX uh, IP address is there. You log in with your cloud admin account. Um, this is where you can add a HCX key. This is where you can configure your public IP to work with Azure Virtual WAN or an application gateway. And this is your express route global reach configuration. This is where you redeem your authorization. Um, I probably should take off Azure Mask, but so you can kind of see this a little bit better, but same sort of concept, right? Your URL is the IP address. The username is cloud admin at vSphere, or uh, yeah, vSphere.local. The admin password is abstracted, right? Um, same with the NSXT environment. And if you need certificate thumbprints, this is all there for you. 
Um, I am using a, an extension called Azure Mask. If you're not familiar, it's a pretty cool extension. Um, it's just basically blurring all of the sensitive information. And so it's deeming this as sensitive information. This is where you would manage, this is where you could add a cluster and you could edit an existing cluster. So I only can go up to four, but if I wanted to, I could type in four and hit save. And about not even 30 minutes later, I would get a fourth cluster, which is crazy to think about because in the way, way back machine, it would take us a lot longer <laughs> to rack and stack and cable management and make sure the v VLANs were configured for that ESXi host. Um, within 25 minutes, it's up and functional and you've got another cluster. This is the simplified networking. So I haven't, this is a newer environment to us. We only got it a couple of weeks back. So we haven't had a ton of time to go in here and do a lot of crazy stuff yet. But this was built when the service deployed. This is the first networking segment. This is the uplink on the NSXT, I think it's the tier one gateway. You can build out a DHCP server here or a relay. You don't have to go into NSXT, which is kind of cool. If you need to do any like port mirroring, you could do some port mirroring components here without having to go into NSXT. And then this is kind of where you could configure DNS zones or a DNS service without having to go into NSXT and configure it. So I think for, for me, realizing that this exists was kind of a cool, compelling thing because I remember when I worked on a vSphere environment, we didn't we, did, we chose not to embrace NSXT. Um, and that was a little bit before it became sort of more of a, a normal configuration pattern for, for customers as well. Um, we, we chose not to move forward with it because it was kind of in its infancy at that point. But um, it's, it's come quite a long way. And our secret sauce, so to speak, is this simplified interface. So if you were one of those customers that wasn't heavy on the NSXT side of life, you had capacity to uh, or you have capacity to do this simplified configuration. And there are PowerShell commandlets that exist. Um, like I said, you could use PowerCLI to get into your environment to connect to vCenter. Um, you could also use the AZ CLI as well. So with that, I think what I'll do here is I will stop sharing and I will now maybe turn this over to some uh, Q&A. What, what do you think? Thumbs up? I think so. Yeah, great presentation. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask questions to Shannon. And there's never a dumb question too, because it's a very, it, like it took me a lot to wrap my head around what we were doing and why we were doing it the way we were doing it. And if you still feel shy, you can reach out to Shannon on her Twitter. Or of course. Yes, oh, yeah. definitely. Hey Shannon, I had a question around that uh, assessment tool you were showing. Is, sure. is that an actual tool that'll analyze an existing VMware environment and and then collect that stuff, or is that just a process you go through with um, Microsoft people? Good question. So we have a newer service that's called Azure Migrate, and I think if you've ever done like an assessment prior to Azure Migrate's existence, you might be familiar with like Movair or like uh, Cloud Endure was another one that I used to work with a lot. Um, it is our own native tooling, and in order for it to work inside of a VMware environment, now it can also assess Hyper-V, but it, in, in order for it to work in a VMware environment, you'll download an OVA file and deploy it locally on your uh, vSphere in, environment on-prem. And then you'll run it, and I always recommend running it as long as possible. Um, in fact, I have customers who probably still have their Azure Migrate instance up because they haven't quite 100% migrated everything. So um, it's something that, you know, you'll probably want to put a Windows license on it if you're going to run it for a long period of time. But maybe it only makes sense to run for about 30 days. And it's a pretty straightforward process. Um, you know, there's a lot, lot, lot of good documentation um, that I can, I can, if you're interested, I can um, send over to you if, and I can kind of get you down that path. But there's a really great way that it, it does all of the assessments without having to do too much, right? Um, it just needs read-only access to the vCenter instance on-prem. OK, thank you. That was helpful. Sure. Hey, Shannon. A long way. Oh, yes. Hi. Hi, this is Malcolm. Hi. How you doing? Uh, thank you for this input. So I have a quick question. Sure. So uh, on the migration, uh, do we always like stay on a inbuilt like Azure Migrate or App Migrate or Data Migrate tools or is there any requirement is going to lead us? We have to go 
with a third party tool in Azure. So yeah, so if you are choosing to use AVS, you would use the HCX tooling that gets deployed by default. Uh, but Azure Migrate's very much so a multi-pronged tool as well. So you can use Azure Migrate to replicate servers. You can initiate a replication kind of synchronization. It'll do block level replication. It's really Azure Site Recovery under the hood. So you'll see a recovery services vault get spun up. It'll be tied to your Azure Migrate project and you'll be able to migrate VMs that way. Um, and then I think you can do very similar things with your database migration. If you can't, I believe it gives you all of kind of the ways in which to get it up and, and functional too. So, um, so yeah, so it, it just depends upon what you're looking to do, right? Um, a lot of customers who are choosing Azure VMware solution, they don't want to take on the burden of responsibility of doing that replication into Azure. They'd rather vMotion the whole thing into Azure without having a, a change window. And so that's what ABS does with the HCX components. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, and Azure Migrate's come a long way. Uh, when it first came about, I, did, I didn't know what the end state was going to be. And I recently went in there to look at one of my old projects and I saw it, there's like a VDI thing. So it can do stuff probably to let you know if you can migrate everything as is to something like WVD. And then if you can, you know, migrate your SQL servers into Azure SQL outright and your, you know, your web servers that are sitting on, you know, Windows servers into app service. So there's all kinds of interesting stuff that Azure Migrate tends to do. Any other questions? I have one if you don't mind. Uh, sure. I guess I was just curious. Um, I, I mean, I could see using uh, th this solution to shift an on-prem solution to the cloud in, in a quick way to get your clusters moved up and, and migrated over. Uh, but do you see that, do you see this this platform being used long term from a strategic perspective or, or would you I mean you, do you just do the lift and shift and then you start migrating into you know native Azure at some point I think it depends upon the customer because I've heard customers that want to get off of AVS they give themselves a year two years whatever the the time frame is and then I've had a number of I've heard of a number of customers that are interested in just staying on it right um, it was a huge change for them to even, even embrace cloud so they're not planning on getting off of it right so so it, it just depends upon the the customer where they are with skilling and so this was a, a nice middle ground for microsoft to meet the enterprise admins who may not have a ton of time to go get skilled up on azure right because it's changing every six to eight weeks there's always some crazy announcement that get that comes out i've gone to meetings with customers and i'll bring something up that's already outdated by way of an azure blog that got released three or four hours before I had a conversation, right? Like it's hard for us to keep up, uh, let alone customers to keep up, right? So um, I think it just depends upon the customer where they are with their journey and what their atti uh, their attitude, no, their appetite is for kind of skilling and making sure that their engineers know how to manage and maintain and kind of modernize, right? Um, so the, the, the big story here is the modernize at, at your own pace and we're not gonna kick you off of the environment, right? If, if you're happy with it, you like the service, we will keep you on there. There's no, there, there shouldn't be any change uh, as far as I can tell. And I mean, I'd like to say until the end of time, but we all know that's not gonna happen, right? Like things always shift and change, but I can't see any reason why Microsoft would flip this service off and say, we're no longer supporting it because it's been a really good partnership. We've had a lot of interested customers come through the pipeline. It's one of the faster growing Azure services at the moment. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, and if, and it, you know, if you've got other questions, if you're considering it um, and you want to go dig deeper, feel free to connect and uh, we can kind of go through some scenarios um, that that might make sense. But yeah, you're right. It's mostly that first go round with the initial lift and shift into Azure. You don't have to be shy. This is your time. You can ask me whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> I can also get you a PDF copy of the slides. So everything that's on there, uh, we can we can share with with folks that are interested. I don't know if you do that, but I know I did have a number of links that might be relevant to reference down the road. Yeah, and once you will share that, I will link it to the uh, recording and the recording will be posted on the YouTube channel for the user group. Perfect.
With that, if no more questions, then I'd like to thank Shannon on behalf of the user group for taking your time and presenting today. It was a great session. Uh, we learned a lot. And thanks to our sponsor, Blue Cross for sponsoring. Yeah, and thanks for having me.